position. Um, Sensible City Lab has been very remarkable work with data visualization of urban uh, environments, particularly patterns, local patterns of mobility, use activity, and so forth. We have a project at New York City, the NYC Talk Exchange, which was recently exhibited at uh, the Museum of Modern Arts, uh, just around the uh, which built off of uh, an existing database provided by a uh, wireless uh, telecom, which is at and right, we were working with. And these visualizations were remarkable in the way that they were able to describe the kind of pulse of the city, but through the kind of patterns and behaviors of the data, right, and the way we were interacting with <coughs> all of the others, with other parts of the world, remotely through officers. And how this was visualized was truly remarkable. Uh, this project, since the uh, trash track, uh, marks their first attempt, as I understand it, to actually start to collect some of that data themselves. Right? Which is to say that they're not uh, based, they're not facing this project on existing data set, but actually getting involved in this and being ready of collecting this data itself. And I won't go into details about this, I will leave that to us, uh, to us up. But um, yeah, I do want to say that it's, it's, uh, it's certainly a remarkable. Um, uh, moment and I think the trajectory of their work and I look forward to uh, hearing more about it tonight. Um, in general, I, I, I think I need to make a few just quick, quickly a few acknowledgements. Clearly, uh, I need to um, uh, thank uh, the Architectural League of New York uh, for in particular the Jay Clausen Mills Fund for providing the support for the five commission projects, um, which you see represented in the gallery next door. Um, at the same time, the Graham Foundation for Advanced Studies in the Fine Arts provided support for the exhibition, uh, specifically the exhibition of the uh, gallery exhibition, and to the University of Buffalo um, to provide support for the, the, the website and the application. Um, <coughs> I want to personally thank the uh, staff of the Architectural League. These are some of the most dedicated and committed people that I've met. Um, incredible effort that's been put into making these happen here. Obviously, Greg Wessner has been in the back there with his arms folded, project director. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, of course, Rosalie Geneva, whose continued commitment to this project since we started with the Architecture and Situated Technologies Symposium in 2006 has made it possible to be here today. So, thank you, and without further ado, that's it for Thanks, Mark. Uh, thanks, everybody in the uh, architectural team for hosting the trash track here. Um, this is actually an interesting time when it comes to data. Yesterday, Carlo and I, um, Carlo, uh, the rest of that, uh, with me um, at MIT, went to a session by the World Economic Forum. Uh, we're trying to convince them to have something in Davos, uh, which focuses on the possibilities to create applications for the public good using personal electronic data. So uh, you know, you're, we're seeing data popping up many different objects, everybody has a computer in their pocket. I'm going to touch on this a little bit soon, so I won't dwell on it now, but in a sense, cities are getting covered with data. We're used to it be, um, being used for uh, emergency response and things like that, but what's the public good that can come out of that? There are great opportunities, a lot of researchers have been doing many interesting things, and uh, <clears throat> I think now, Cities and administrations are beginning to understand this. IBM just had a conference in the past two days called Smarter Cities. They're trying to wire up cities with information. Cisco is doing the same. Intel is jumping in the SAP. Uh, but most importantly, administrations are um, understanding the importance of starting to watch for the concerns about privacy, but also um, keep in mind the opportunities Lie using this kind of data for the public good. Now, I decided with this presentation not to focus just on trash because uh, so far when we're presenting this project, 
who didn't mention any of our other projects, I became trash guy. So uh, you know, people would come to me at the end of the exhibition and say, hey, do you know where I can throw this away? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I'm going to give some background, actually mostly for, um, for you to understand a little bit of the context behind it, why are we interested in cracking garbage. We're not municipal um, waste removal uh, research group or something like that. Uh, we're focusing on pervasive information and ubiquitous computers. So I'll, I'll touch on a few projects. Uh, some to detail, some less. Feel free to interrupt if you have something to say. And at the end, I'll uh, go to the trash track and then we'll just uh, scoot around the corner and take a look at the visualization. So we're studying, we've been studying this data after this project, and it turns out actually that there's something interesting about the usage of cell phones. Cell phones are almost like the nervous system of cities. We use them in a very different way depending on what we do. So now I'm here with you, I don't make a phone call, I don't even answer a text. Uh, but maybe later I'll, I'll step outside for a second, I'll make a quick call, come back. Um, it turns out that this pattern, I don't have anything to draw with, but this pattern of start at a dip, then something like this, and another dip is representative of sports events. So if you take this data, you know, as it collects and um, as you accumulate it over time, and you just do some very basic signal processing throughout the scene, you can identify the places where people watch sports games over time. This is totally anonymous, there's no invasion of privacy, but it's very powerful if you think of this idea of a new kind of planning where land use is to be stacked, you, know, you want to use spaces ultimately like the old cities used to be, you want to have a store in the first floor and then you know, live above it and then have some, some, some place for uh, uh, maybe a gathering or a cultural experience in the same area. It's important to study what are the ways the city is used and this allows us to really look in detail uh, into those activities just by analyzing the signal from a cell phone network. You know, this, if you apply a bit more analysis to this data, you can start getting towards a resource allocation. Here in the red, we separated pedestrians. So on the Telecom Italia servers, they analyzed the acceleration of each of those cell phones, aggregated it over those pixels that you see, and then sent it to us anonymously. So we're looking at pedestrians versus the real-time location of buses in the yellow. Uh, and then you can ask questions like, you know, are, is the system designed optimally? Supply versus demand. Um, should we now move towards a situation where the buses come to meet the people rather than vice versa? You know where the buses are, you know where the people are. Why not allow for that to happen? Now this is a question you just mentioned earlier. Uh, that was shown in the uh, Museum of Modern Art. Here, this is a partnership with AT&T. Um, we're looking at global communication. There are a lot of questions in, um, in uh, urban economics that try to describe how markets interact globally, how uh, different cities interact, representing sort of almost cliques of uh, cities that exchange information uh, between them, the, um, there have been Saskia Sassen here in Colombia has, a, has an interesting thesis about little communities of cities um, and how globally they make communities depending on what they have to offer information wise. A lot of this uh, has been based so far on anecdotal evidence. Here we're looking at real communications data. This is IP information uh, from New York to other global cities around the world. And the, 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 the shape represents the sunlight as it approaches. You can see here South America as it wakes up. The, the blob around the connection represents the intensity of communication. And um, beyond telling us something about how the city is connected to the rest of the world, as you analyze this data, you can answer some interesting questions in urban economics. We're also looking um, in more detail when you zoom into New York. You can see, you, you can study actually the component of social networking in global economics. So the way we communicate with each other act also relates to how information about um, expe expectation value is communicated. So think about bubbles, right? We Bubbles are developed when people talk about purchases they made that are successful. And if this data propagates too fast, you know that there's something there that you should watch for. So even on a macro level, this data holds quite big Premises. In a sense, 
social sciences are on the verge of a little revolution because of this kind of pervasive data. A lot of things that so far could not be quantitative can become quantitative. And these models scale up from the micro level to the macro level. Like, you know, psychological models don't if you want to look at overall cultural phenomena. Um, or microeconomics models don't, don't, don't really scale up to macroeconomic models. So we have a lot to expect, I think, when it comes to how this data um, is valuable for um, <coughs> social sciences. This is zooming into New York. Landline calls in and out of the city. This is flushing. You know, it used to be Koreatown, now it's becoming Chinatown. This is a list. It's, it's actually 200 countries long uh, of where people call to and from. Bensonhurst, right? It's a Jewish neighborhood. Look how Ohio, Jerusalem, and Tel Aviv is. Um, it's almost like a real time census. You can know the demographic composition of a place very accurately just by looking at incoming and outgoing calls. Again, this data that's already there, it's, it's almost junk for some of those companies, and it could, it could be valuable for studying place. Uh, I'll start jumping a bit more quickly. This is a project we did for the city of Florence. Uh, we have a partnership there with the mayor. <clears throat> they were interested in a new kind of um, urban furniture to bring information back to people. So, so far we've been looking at how to collect information. Uh, cell phone networks are useful, energy networks. Uh, we've been analyzing uh, transportation networks as well. There's all sorts of large infrastructure in the city that if you capture some data from it, you can extract a lot of value and knowledge. Uh, but how do you give it back to people? You know, this idea of making better informed decisions in real time. You know, we can think of applications in the mobile device, uh, large scale um, displays in the city. Um, we decided to look at, look at this as a, an information ribbon. We want to be for the city uh, that guided our design of this uh, bus shelter. So a layer of information in real time that gathers data from sensors, from these large networks we talked about earlier, uh, and presents it to the public in real time. Uh, in Florence, so th this, is, um, this is an example of how, how trip planning works in that system. You just touch with your finger in one place, and um, it knows where the bus is in real time, other modes of transport, but it also knows congestion and environmental condition, so it can tell you what's the best way to get to where you want to get. Uh, how long is it, going, is it going to take? Where to switch? Are your two buses going to sync up? So in a sense, the experience of the public transportation system becomes better without even changing the actual service. Uh, in Florence, they have the, they asked us to put all, the, all sorts of things in the bus stop. And um, one of them was, uh, so they want the, the interactive fountain, water nebulizer to freshen up the air, uh, but also aromatherapy, which uh, is probably to, to, uh, to relax some of, some of these Italians that are really, really pissed off in the bus. <laughs> this, is, this is the design. Uh, this is a bus pole. Here you have being displayed as reflective, um, giving you information about um, the number uh, of the bus, how long is it going to take it to come. It has a has here a little icon that tells you you have to run, can you walk, do you have time for a coffee? <laughs> <laughs> These are photovoltaic cells on the top. Here is the interactive trip planning map you saw earlier. Um, that's basically how, how it communicates information. It's very simple. Um, ambient display on the large scale and the small scale is higher resolution, more rich data. That's in the shelter version. That's in the Italian, Italian version. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing that touches on architecture, this is something that we put um, put together for the expo, it was uh, in Saragossa last year. And there we were again asking, how can information be combined with architecture to create a sense of uh, a digital building. Information communicated through the actual uh, uh, envelope of the building. So it's a concept that came out of a, of a class at MIT where you know, we we're thinking of a ribbon with a lot of valves on the top that opens and closes. And uh, based on a signal from a computer, it could create images, patterns. Based on a signal from a sensor, it could open up when you try to cross it, like, a, like Moses. Uh, 
So we went ahead with this, with this idea and designed this building, um, which we called the Digital Water Pavilion. Um, the, it's just a slab, basically. And the slab has all around 3,000 little valves. And they're controlled by a machine. The machine uh, opens and closes these valves. It's almost like a printer. But it makes, uh, it makes walls. Sensors uh, open it up when you approach. Uh, it also goes through the building so you can divide the space in flexible ways based on occupancy. Um, the water comes from above, falling down, so you don't really need a lot of energy uh, to bring it up there. The, the, this, this is a bridge by Zaha Hadid there in the back. And the, the theme of the expo that year was, was water. That's why we decided to um, focus on it here. The, whole, the roof can come down and the architecture vanishes. So they liked it, but we didn't think it's going to be built because a lot of time passed and the expo was coming up. But about um, six months before the opening, they came to us and said, well, we want to do it. Uh, so we put together a team from around the world. We're engineers from uh, France, working with people here in Boston and MIT, and people in the region of Zaragoza. And uh, it opened almost fully complete, so the the valves around were working, the roof didn't come up and down by the opening, but it was working, and this, this is one of the researchers in the lab testing uh, the, the, the sensors. This is a person who was a bit puzzled during the opening. <laughs> um, we tried to project on it. This is Carlo uh, trying to avoid getting wet. Um, basically, this is going to be open fully, I think, uh, this coming spring. Um, last project before I get to trash track. Um, Mayor of Copenhagen partnered with us. They're hosting this year's uh, climate summit. It's where the Kyoto Agreement is supposed to be rewritten to uh, set the new standards for global emissions for countries. Um, and they were asking, how can we use this idea of small augmentation in terms of technology um, to make our city more sustainable? They wanted to use this to communicate to the rest of the world that the city, the city's practice, which is already quite high up there in terms of care for the environment. Um, and they also wanted to push it a step further. Now, I don't know if you, were, if you have ever been to Copenhagen, but they, I think they have the highest penetration of bicycle usage uh, in the developed world. Uh, it's a city of 500,000, 520,000 people with 600,000 bikes. Uh, built infrastructure everywhere. Um, so we were thinking, okay, pretty good, 50% uh, of the trips are done by bicycle, but what can we do to make it better? Um, wouldn't it be nice if the bike could actually capture some information from the environment? Because you ride around everywhere, everybody has a bicycle. What about communicating this information to your friends? You also have a big problem with bike theft, so you wanted people to know where, they bike, where their bikes are all the time. Um, so we started looking around for these kind of solutions that we can see if, if, if something like that exists. So the electric bike is not appealing yet. Uh, actually, it's booming. This year, they predict about 100 million of them to be sold worldwide. Um, and you know, bikes that have sensors on them are not there yet either. Um, but they can provide quite useful information. So we came up with a concept, which is, <laughs> Something that you can do on any bike. The idea is that you, you can retrofit your bike with this back wheel. It has hybrid kit capacity. You can capture your energy when you brake. It powers up environmental sensors, location sensors, and you can communicate this information afterwards. So, this is what we're going to put into this. And um, it's going to be built with the uh, Ducati in Italy. Um, uh, this, this is a little bit technical about what's inside. There's a generation, or, um, there's a little controller on the handlebar that works uh, on a short range uh, wireless communication protocol, uh, Bluetooth. Um, and the, the idea is that as this thing captures energy, you can decide if you want it to help you push uphill or supplement your torque. It has a torque sensor in the, in the pedals. You can tell it, okay, multiply my torque by two, by three, or actually work against me. 
if you want to work out or if you want to actually collect more energy than you have in your batteries at the moment. And all this time, the environmental sensors are collecting data and communicating with outwards. It arrives in your personal uh, account and you can decide then who to share it with and how. You can share it with your friends uh, and then everybody in your network benefits from this environmental data. You can plan a route that is clean to move through the city. You can share it anonymously with the city. Uh, and then the city gets this nice representation of what's going on environmentally without having to deploy a lot of expensive sensors. Um, in a sense, the wheel almost becomes your friend. It tells you how you're breathing physically, it tells you what quality of air you breathe, it can give you a push, and you can stick it in any pie. So that was the concept there where um, we're moving ahead with this actually this morning. I was just, I was just uh, uh, meeting with the, with the deputy mayor here in New York of Copenhagen, and uh, they decided to put it on 600 bicycles uh, owned by the municipality. So they have 1,200 cars owned by City Hall. Now they want to reduce this number by half and replace half the cars with this wheel. So that's what they do it. Uh, this would be nice. The, this is an example of the aggregate information you get if you are uh, if you're on the municipality side. You can understand the environmental impact of, your, of everybody's trips. You can understand the cost of infrastructure because they put a lot of money into building bike infrastructure. You can understand how many bikes are in the system at the moment. And the nice thing is that in parallel to the climate summit, they're hosting something they call the Mayor Summit. At the same time, Bloomberg is going to be there, uh, Mayor of Rio, just got nominated for the city for the Olympics actually today. Uh, um, Mayor of uh, Tokyo, Sao Paulo. So a lot of the big cities are going to be there and a lot of them are interested in incorporating bikes in a more extensive way in the city. This is the first prototype we built. Next prototype will include those features you saw. Usually it plays. First prototype actually didn't have the torque sensor, so had this throttle, we got rid of it. This is the wireless communication module. And put it on play. Crash track. So, um, Here we're interested in seeing um, what happens when really everything becomes ubiquitous. If you have um, information about what a thing is and where it is in real time, can we create situations of minimum waste? So um, we developed a little tab, it's about that big, I'll actually pass it around in a sec. Um, and uh, made it as energy efficient as we could. It lives up to six months. And uh, the idea was to engage volunteers in New York, Seattle, and London, primarily Seattle, in tagging their own garbage. Uh, and they, and we, were, we were aiming at showing everybody where our garbage goes in real time. So this was inspired actually by this event. Uh, so we, we saw the call for, uh, for proposals. I think it was about a year, over a year ago. And we submitted uh, Trash Track as a proposal, and it got accepted, and then we realized that it got so much um, momentum as we were working on it, so we scaled it up from New York to other places uh, as we were planning for the open year two weeks ago. Um, so it, it really feeds up with the idea of smart dust, where, where technological elements take advantage of ubiquitous networking that's around cities today, uh, they can be sensors, they can report location, and this, right? This is a major problem today. There is a, there is a rumor that there is something about the size, twice the size of Texas in the middle of the ocean between Hawaii and Japan, where all the currents meet uh, and a lot of plastic gathers. So waste has a major impact on our, on our environment, um, and we thought that Doing this tagging exercise with waste would also make the point that if you can, if you can tag waste, you can tag almost anything. Um, now think about this computer, for example. I get it. I know it was produced in China. It was shipped to Cupertino, assembled, and went to my office. Almost every component in it, there is a genealogy uh, of how it was, how it was built, where, what materials it's made of. Now. When you dispose of it, 
yeah, some belief is taken care of in a good way, but we've heard a lot of stories of, of the, about these things getting smuggled to developing countries and disposed of the wrong way. People extract precious metals in them. Actually, the increase in regulation in how to recycle these, um, these objects has created a market for smuggling. Because now it costs a lot to recycle them here, especially in OECD countries in Europe. Uh, so a lot of them get smuggled across the border. If we tag them, we get to know where they go. So this was the idea. Tags are put on garbage using volunteers. Tags listen for, um, yeah, pass it around. Tags listen for uh, cell reception around them. Uh, they record a signal strength from each cell phone tower uh, they see, and then they just send this, send this to us. And we process this on our servers at MIT. Uh, it's a very low energy way of doing locationing. This thing can live for six months and it's quite robust. We embed this in all sorts of materials that I'll show you in a second. I'll pass it around. Be careful it was in garbage. <laughs> now, for studying the system, we like to use the analogy of, uh, of nuclear medicine. You know, when you go there, you, you get tracers put in your blood. You get to see how the system really works. So there's one thing, how the system was designed to work. <coughs> the waste management system has been around for about 100 years. Other than advances in technology in terms of separating the waste or burning the waste, converting it to energy, there's not been a great change in that system over almost 100 years. So studying this, <coughs> similar to how we put tracers in our blood, will for the first time allow us to see how the system really functions. This was the first version of the tag we developed. Um, the second version uh, is this. This is the one I'm moving around. And uh, later we started working with, uh, with Qualcomm. They uh, gave us this, which um, we modified. Now it can work for two months. This uses cell triangulation like the other one like I just handed out, but it also uses GPS. The problem with GPS is that you can't get GPS reception in a, in a pile of trash. But uh, you know, when this thing is on top of a pile, or just moving in the street, you can get pretty good location. So we're enjoying both worlds here. One of these around. These are the types of objects we, we tag. Actually, we're, we're working with a, with a person called Tim Gutowski at MIT. Uh, um, He's a professor for civil engineering. And his primary focus is on end of life of objects. And uh, together we developed a, almost like a wedding list of garbage uh, that we put online. And the volunteers who joined the project in Seattle uh, were asked to uh, prepare in advance 20, 10 to 20 items and keep them at home till our teams come to their place and help them tag the garbage. And uh, they were asked to tick the types of garbage they collect so that we make sure we have everything in the, in the list. And the list was designed based on A, representing as reliably as possible the type of garbage produced by an average domestic household, but also put a focus on those objects that have uh, a particular impact on the environment, like uh, they have a big snail problem, they have snail poison, uh, tires, tetra packs, uh, other household chemicals, styrofoam. <coughs> now we're doing this because after you know, after this data is collected on our servers, we are going to have um, two or three of our PhD students analyze the data from a statistical standpoint to understand what goes where, what gets recycled, and how. This is from the first. Um, uh, event we threw with volunteers. This is at the Seattle Public Library. They hosted our exhibition there in parallel to uh, the architecture of being here. Uh, people came, 50 were invited, uh, and each brought one object. And together with them, we tagged the stuff. So these are people from our team, Christine and Jen. Um, and uh, we use this light foam for cups. So if you, if you, if you tag anything that's recyclable, cups, bottles, uh, boxes, <laughs> then we wanted to use something light that won't change the weight of the object uh, a lot. So that when it's separated later with the, in the mechanical processes, uh, it won't be considered uh, uh, something else. 
they do the separation of, of recyclables based on their weight. Um, this is me uh, operating on a teddy bear. <laughs> and, and actually, later we presented this project at the, uh, at the public library. Um, after we already knew where this thing was going, uh, the, wo the woman who came, uh, the woman who gave me this teddy bear, came and she asked, Where is my teddy bear? Where is my teddy bear? People got so engaged in Seattle in the project. Times we would get 100 emails a day from volunteers wanting to participate. And when we got there for the opening, it was after the local media did a bit of coverage on this, people recognized us in the street. Mm -hmm. Very strange. <laughs> shoes, you know, how do you tag shoes? We have to stick it in there and put some foam, uh, hide it. If this is shown very obviously, then the manual processes will make sure this goes immediately to landfill. This is an example of the first deployment we did in, in Boston. We just tested three tags to see if they really work. Uh, so uh, making sure it transmits from within the, the garbage trucks and, uh, uh, and the distribution centers. On one of those traces, we created a street view, view visualization. So we're now flying after the garbage. <laughs> Seeing where it goes. and traces, and this is what we're showing at the, uh, at the actual exhibition. So there's footage taken by video artist Armin Lincoln, and on top of it, we're showing one by one the traces of objects from where they are today, or where they've been seen last, all the way to the place where they were disposed and the trace they took from that moment. Uh, we have a description of how many days they've been spending in the system, how many miles they've traversed, and what is that object itself. Um, this is coming in as we speak, so this data is in real time. Every once in a while, the system goes to the database and it asks what's new, what's going on, and if there is a new tag in the system, it grabs the information from it and shows, throws it on the map, shows where it is and how it traveled so far. So sequentially, data is added up incrementally. Um, into the visualization. Now, this exhibition is going to go on for uh, uh, another few weeks, but the project will go on for a couple of more years. Um, and uh, here, again, two more, two main goals. One of them is to see what is the impact on the public as we show people where their garbage really goes. You know, many of us, when we throw something away, we think it's gone. Now we tag it, so the, the whole system comes to light. Uh, what if you knew that the plastic cup we threw two days ago was sitting on a hill 20 miles away? It's actually going to stay there for quite some time. What is the impact in, term of, in terms of awareness? I think this relates to the issue of, of pervasive data and, uh, and how citizens can become more involved in, in, uh, in resource allocation and maintaining the, <clears throat> the big infrastructures that make our life possible in cities. So think about, look at where we got to now. For a long time, people thought that energy is free and that we don't really have a negative impact on the environment. Fine. Uh, what if, you know, it could be that someday we invent a robot that can clean up after us and, uh, and uh, you know, then the, the waste we produce will not have any negative consequence. But we saw that, that being unaware of our impact on the system, on the planet, on the major infrastructure in the city, you know, can get to a dead end. And then we suddenly have to go through this education process, take a 90 degree turn, which can be very powerful, very painful, and a uh, long, kind of dangerous, actually. So the idea here is that through real time information, people have the capacity to actually participate in the management of the system from the bottom up. You get information about where is there cheap energy, where is there uh, uh, a dirty place in terms of air so you don't pollute there with your car, how does your waste move, you know, this could also work towards emergency response in real time. So citizens from the bottom up participating in maintaining the city. Uh, 
in combination with the top-down management that's already there in place. Uh, second second uh, goal of this project is to uh, allow for a better understanding of waste removal system. Can we rethink some of the some of the processes there? You know, do the distribution center need to be in different places? Maybe the waste to energy conversion facilities need to be closer to our homes. Do we really need to have those cars traverse every street in order to collect our trash? Uh, so these are some of the questions we asked, and surprisingly to us. When we presented this to waste management, the biggest waste removal company in the US, uh, they said, great, we want, to, we want to study our systems as well. So they gave us almost all the funding for carrying out this project in combination with what we got from the architectural league and from Falcon. So I think that's a, that's a brave step on their side to really take a risk and study how things move through their system. So, I'll just jump to thank waste management, welcome, the architecture of the spring giving us data connectivity, public library, and Seattle Public Utilities. And also to thank the team at MIT, so that's Carlo Batti, the director. Uh, I am the associate director of the lab. It was Christian Kloikel, who led the project in the last phase. Uh, Eugenio Morello and Stan Sertinaldi. Jennifer Dunham, uh, E-Room Can, Louis Giraud, <coughs> Uh, hopefully I'm not forgetting anybody, but these were the main people uh, who made this project happen. Again, thanks a lot to the architecture group for uh, having us here. This is wonderful and to the uh, situated technologies um, for arranging this. I uh, I don't know if we have time for questions, but I'll be happy to take some.